believe we have been called by God and we've been chosen for this hour. We are no better than anyone else. We're no better than any other denomination, except we have been called by his name. Father, it's all
He is good. Amen. All the time. Amen. Hallelujah. He is worthy of all our praise. Amen. Amen. As you go back to your seats, amen. Thank you for coming to the front and praying and worshiping and praising God. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you very, very much for being here tonight. I know it's always a special effort to make it on a Wednesday night. Thank you for coming. And uh, just as a, as a quick announcement, uh, I'll be going to Joshua chapter 1. But just so you remember, Brother Tom Kelly and his wife, he used to come to our church quite a while. And, and his wife Mary had been very, very sick on and off, in and out of the hospital 20, 30 times. And we just got notified she passed away the other night. So please hold Brother Tom up in prayer. Sister Canell, I was there to see her at the hospital, and she's got a, had a leg infection. <laughs> and she's gone home doing better, so keep praying for her. Uh, Sister Palmer is doing better. Please pray for her and the Eastmans and Janice Hawley. She's bouncing back little by little from her surgery. And hold up uh, Brother Paul Welch. I just got a notice from them. His, his brother just passed away up there in Pensacola, and they've asked us to pray for the family. So please pray for them. I know you got a lot of things to pray about, but try to remember these folks and pray. I, I, I just talked to Brother Alex, and we're just going to alter the uh, thing on Saturday just a little bit. If you folks have attended the classes, Okay, the leadership seminar, uh, teaching the last two weeks, and you plan on going Saturday also. If you want the tapes, the, the church will pick up the tab. I don't want you to have to pay for something that you sacrifice to come to. So if you have been an attendee in the seminars or, or this Saturday, fine. They'll have a CD or DVD in the back. If you want it, you can have it and you don't have to pay for it. And as far as the lunch goes, you don't have to pay for your lunch. We'll, we'll take care of your lunch. We just appreciate you coming. So, so that way you, you'll be able to be here. And Brother Davies is, um, has built a phenomenal church in Tampa. He runs 12, 1,400 people. And uh, his first church I've ever been in in my life that when you walk in the back door, they have eight charge machines on the back wall that you just give with your credit cards. And I'm going, wow. Be my luck. I put it in and it says denied. <laughs> anyway, he'll teach and Brother Rashid Collins will be with us also. So, so be here if you possibly can. Joshua, Joshua chapter uh, 1. And then I'm going to uh, Joshua chapter 13. Beginning with uh, Joshua 1 and... Uh, Verse 1, after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass, the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now there arise and go over this Jordan, thou and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Now look at someone and say, the land was a divine gift. But they had to fight to get it. Okay, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, I have given unto you as I said unto Moses. Now watch, God is going to give him now a map of what God's will is. It's a map. If you were looking at the map, he said every place, he said what? From the wilderness of this Lebanon, even until the great river, the Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites and to the great sea towards the going down of the sun shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life as I was with Moses. So I'll be with thee. I will not fail thee nor forsake thee. Okay, now that's a pretty good promise, man. That's, that's pretty nice. He, he told Israel, I've given all this to you. The argument that's going on right now in, in the East has been the Palestinians and the Muslims they, and the Arabs, they all say that land's ours, but it was given, it was given to the Jew. It wasn't, it wasn't given to anybody else. And uh, if you saw the news the other day, your friend Obama just gave uh, uh, the Muslims and the Palestinians 
those are staying against Jerusalem, over $200 million in his last act against the Jews as president. And, uh, and now they're griping, complaining, because they want to know where Trump gets the money for the Mexican wall. If he'd have got, kept that money here, we could have paid for it. <laughs> anyway, uh, just so you understand that the land was given to the Jews, okay? It was a, it was a gift from God. It was a gift from God. When Israel came out of bondage, he said, here, I'm giving you this land. And then he drew a map for you from this over here to the hills there, to the Hittites, to the Amorites, down to the Euphrates River. In fact, I'm giving you all the way to where the sun sets. That's all yours. Now let me go to chapter 13. I, 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 really, I'm not trying to be funny. I'm really trying to be spiritual. And now Joshua was old and stricken in years. I know that feeling. And the Lord said unto him, Thou art old and stricken in years. <laughs> that seems so funny. He's walking on a walker. And the Lord said, You're old and stricken in years. Thank you for telling me. <laughs> he says, Thou art old and stricken in years, and there remaineth yet very much land to be possessed. He said, I've given you the land. But you ain't doing nothing with it. All the chronological findings that I've been able to study shows that at this date, when he was well stricken in years and had come to the end of getting a hold of the promised land, Joshua was nearing 90 years old. He was 20 years past the promise of God, three score and ten, and if by strength, four score. And he's still fighting, and he's still doing stuff, and he's still doing But he's got to a place now where he's going to go from wealth warfare to government. He's, he, he's, he's taking the land. Now he's got to get them to rule the land. Now, uh, just let me, I'm, what I want to talk to you about is it's time to possess what you've been promised. It's time to possess your possessions, what you've been promised. Lord, bless the teaching. Help me to be a blessing in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. While you're being seated, I just want to read one other scripture to you. You, you, you don't have to stand for this. I want to read this. Chapter 18. A.K. 18. Well, I'm going to read verse 1. And the whole congregation of the children of Israel assembled together at Shiloh. That was their headquarters set up the tabernacle of the congregation there, the land was subdued before them. Everybody said subdued. subdued. Said not possessed. Not, possessed. not governed. Not, governed. Not, ruled. not ruled. Just subdued. subdued. Now watch. and go a little further. And there remained among the children of Israel seven tribes. They ain't got but twelve. And one and a half are on the other side of Jordan. Reuben and the Gedites, they, they took theirs on the other side of the river. So now they ain't got 12. Now they got 10 and a half. Out of the 10 and a half, seven ain't got their possession yet. Watch what it says. The land was subdued, but we have a little incident here. We have a little problem. Seven of the tribes have not taken over the promise that was given to them. Because it's easy to coexist with evil than to confront evil. Watch, watch what it says. He said, and, <laughs> oh God. He said, there was these seven tribes that had not ever got their land yet. They haven't got anything done. He said, you, you, the, the, the land that, at verse 2, he said, Yet very much land to be possessed. This is the land that ye remaineth. And then it gives you the description of all the land that they hadn't taken yet. Okay, and so, so uh, did I pray? I did. I didn't feel nothing. Wow. Okay. I, I, I want to talk to you about possessing your possessions. Now, please don't take offense. I'm going to be very, hope not crass. But, but straightforward. 
Okay? The land was given by God, so it's a, a gift of grace. Okay? A gift of grace. It was given for them to possess. But listen carefully now. To be given a promise is not the same as possessing a promise. And just like Israel, too many of us enjoy hearing what's been promised us, but we don't possess it. We, we, we give those promises to two or three special people who can pray for the sick and heal the sick and cast out devils, and the rest of us, we just live with the Canaanites. Please don't take offense. This is a little crude here, but don't take offense. Contrary to what's being told and taught, you cannot name it and claim it. You cannot blab it and grab it. You cannot confess and possess. That, that, that's TV jargon. That's baloney. Okay? You, you, you can't just make a declaration and all devils and demons say, Oh my, it's a Pentecostal, and they run away. It doesn't happen. And, and you can stand up in hell's face and show them your contract that was signed by God and say, this land is mine. And they'll just look at you and say, take it, jerk, if you can. See, because sometimes if you're not careful, you'll think because God promised you something and gave you something in promise, that it automatically becomes your possession. It only becomes your possession when you're willing to dispossess who's there. In other words, the Lord didn't just give him the land and he drove all the inhabitants out. He said, no, I'm giving you the land. So that ought to encourage you because I've already guaranteed your ownership and your victory. It's already guaranteed. But you've got to be involved in the fracas. You've got to be involved in the fight. I'm not just going to kill all these people and you move in. It ain't going to happen. You're going to have to confront them. You're going to have to challenge them. Why? Because as they challenge and as they go after them and contend with them, that is the release of faith and courage in God. <clears throat> yeah, just stay with me just a minute. If, if you can accept this, you may not be able to, but if you can accept this, the book of Joshua has an equivalent book in the New Testament. It's the six chapters of the book of Ephesians. Their warfare is on the planet. Our warfare takes place on the planet, but it's really in the heavenlies. Remember that one lesson I told you about the captain of the Lord's host and the spirits that were behind all these pagans and the idols? Those spirits have to be dispossessed. When, when they're dispossessed and thrown out of their places, then the victory on the earth takes place. We are fighting against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And so that's why, please don't, don't take offense, that's why your 15-minute prayer life don't, can't, don't scare nobody. Your little 20-minute little something ain't going to work. The powers that are in the heavenlies as well as what is in the land, like, like the Canaanites, are deeply entrenched. They have been here before we got here. They're not leaving without a fight or an argument. Now, the difference between us and the Lord Jesus, him being the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and we only have an earnest and a portion of the Holy Ghost, he never met a devil that he couldn't defeat, and he never met a disease he couldn't dismiss, and he never met a dysfunction he couldn't correct. But then again, he was God Almighty manifest in the body. Now, when you have the Holy Ghost, you got God Almighty manifested in you, but in a measure. The Bible said, you read John 2, it says, God gave the man Jesus the Holy Ghost without measure. Why? Because his miracles were without number. The earth, that John said, if the earth itself contained all the books of the things that Jesus did, it wouldn't be sufficient. Boy. Normally, I wait till about 30 minutes before you get this quiet. You started really quiet. This is going to, 
this is going to be an uphill battle here, I can tell. I am uh, talking to myself and just letting you listen. I have rehearsed many, many, many of the promises that God has given to me and given to this church. And I am firmly convinced tonight that I do not possess what I've been promised. I have some of the things that God has promised to me, but I don't have all the things that God has promised to me. And what happens is, if you live at that level long enough, you'll think that's normal. Now look, we got to get to the reality of this thing. God's ideal for Israel was not Israel's ideal for Israel. God's idea was take all the land. Israel's idea was take what you can and let the other guys stay. Mm. If I can say this kindly, Eric, let me look at you. You're always my friend, okay, kindly. God's ideal for us is twofold. One, that we might know him intimately and personally possess everything he promised. It's almost going back to David and Samuel when he made that glorious statement to God, do as thou hast said. You told me my son Solomon is going to reign in this kingdom and I got a lot of stuff going on right now. Put him on the throne. Do as thou hast said. And we've got to reach a place in our walk with God that we look at this stuff and say, thank you for what we possess. Thank you for everything you've given to us. Thank you for the improvement in our lives. But as I read the map, there's a whole bunch of stuff that's promised to us that we ain't possessing. And that's why when I read that scripture over here in Joshua 13, he said, there is much land yet to be possessed. What was Joshua saying? What's your problem? Here's what the problem is. Listen carefully. When Israel got freed from slavery, they were just like us when we got freed from slavery. We were thrilled, we were ecstatic, we were joyful, we were excited about what the future held. We made commitments and dedications against anything that was anti-God, that was unlike Jesus. We were going to kill those areas and defeat those areas. And what happened to them is the same thing what happens to us. We get tired of fighting. Nobody can live at attention very long. Sooner or later, you got to get out of that mode. And just think what I'm saying. They got freed, and we got freed, watch, to be introduced to new conflict. And what happens is, the longer you stay in conflict, the more weary you become. And you got two ways to deal with conflict. Defeat your foe or coexist. Joshua was very, very concerned with the fact that after X number of years of being in the land, and he's now an old man, they have not yet taken the land. There's seven full tribes that don't have their position yet. They enjoy living. They camped at Shiloh. The ark was at Shiloh. Watch what they did. They're like Pentecostals. Oh, I got all kinds of hell and chaos and my life's out of control. But I love church. And so they'd make these forays and didn't win anything. They'd come back to Shiloh. And there was the ark. And there was the tabernacle. And it was, well, I know we're supposed to own this land. And we're supposed to drive out these iron chariots. And we're supposed to defeat those guys. But they're tough. And they've been here a long time, and they don't like us. And so if you don't mind it, we'll just enjoy being free from Egypt rather than possess Canaan. 
And if God has allowed us a miracle to go across the Jordan into Canaan, and we don't go very far, they won't bother us. You see, hell and evil only bothers you and I when we invade. If we have this little line drawn in the sand, and here's where we live our spiritual life, and there's where they live their demon life, if we don't make an intrusion, they'll leave us alone. You're not getting it yet. You're not getting it yet. It, it, it behooves us that we should get inspired to possess what we have been promised. God's ideal was, God's intention was, to surpass their natural contentment. Watch ours. Well, I'm a nice person. I don't curse. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't mess around. I've got good morals. I pay my bills. I tell the truth sometimes. I put money in the till. I'm okay. I'm not a bad person. Fine. Thank God for all those wonderful things that you're able to do. But God is drawing you a map. He drew Joshua a map. Read it, Joshua 1. This is all the land that I've given to you. Now go possess it. Watch what the book of Ephesians said. This is all the land I've given you. Go possess it. Cast down imaginations. Cast down every high thought and bring into captivity every thought to the obedience of Jesus Christ. Pulling down strongholds. Casting down imaginations. If, if I can say, boy, I feel like I'm among enemies here. Yeah. You okay? I'm trying to help you with this. In other words, we got freed, Israel got freed, to be introduced to new battles and more fighting. Remember, when they got freed, they didn't do no fighting. They killed the lamb, put the blood on, the Lord said, I'll take care of the rest. When they came back out and they got away from Egypt, he said, you ain't got to do nothing. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Push. I'll open the Red Sea. You get through a free ride like, like Aladdin's carpet. You come on through there. When they come, I'll wipe them out. And if you're not careful, you'll say, and that's the way the rest of my life's going to be. And then God turns around and says, okay, no more tricks. Now, you ready? See all them guys? They're living in your house. Go kill them. Come on, you want to possess? Yeah, okay, then dispossess. Throw them out. Tell them you're the new landlords. Seven of the tribes said, not me. I ain't about to fight. I ain't about to confront that which is against me. I'll just coexist. And I'll keep looking at the promise of the map of what I'm supposed to be having that I don't have. And then what I'll do, I'll listen to some nincompoop self-appointed theologian or self-appointed scholar, and I'll let him lie with a damnable lie and say to me, that was only for the first century. That, that stuff that they did, that first century church, that don't belong to us. And if you're not willing to fight, you will just unknowingly say, that's right, let's just sit. You know, it's kind of frustrating to be freed from sin and from slavery and then be put in the army. They got a free ride. God gave them out. He brought them out. You understand that Israel and children of God today, church people, we both brought out the same way, water and spirit. We're both brought out. They were brought out of Pharaoh's and Egypt's kingdom. We're brought out of sin and Satan's kingdom. And we come out supernaturally. But what happens is we're not aware of that once we come out, then the Lord issues us hard hats, brogan boots, fatigues, M16s. Said, okay, now listen, I'm going to send you back in and fight. And when you say fight to a Pentecostal, they almost backslide. Who, me fight? That's what I pay stupid. 
husband to do. He's supposed to fight for me. I don't fight. I watch TV. You're looking at me like, I don't care what you say. I ain't fighting. I'm not challenging no devils. We get along just fine. Why would I want to possess what God gave to me? I'll let hell possess it. If you go a little further in this book, the Bible said, and the Lord came down in the form of an angel, and he says, how long till you possess what I gave you? Why aren't you possessing what I gave you? We don't want to fight. We, we learn to coexist with my enemy. I mean, we're better than they are. They'll be damned and lost. We'll be saved. But we're not, we're not going to possess this land. And, and the whole challenge that Joshua had with Israel, as we have in the kingdom, is there's much land yet to be possessed. Yeah, can, can, uh, let me say this without doing uh, disrespect to the word of the Lord. Watch. He said, there's much land yet to be possessed. Let me say it to you. There is much Lord yet to be possessed. Thank God for every experience we've had with the Lord. Thank God for baptism in Jesus' name, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. Thank God for times we've had prayers answered and miracles have happened. But I'm telling you, there are dimensions and spheres and places in the Holy Ghost that we did not get just when we got saved. And, and God wants us to know Him. I really believe God is trying to take us as a church to experience like Job said. I have heard of thee with the hearing of the ear, but now my eye seeth thee. And it's almost like what Naaman said. I thought, but now I know. So the whole issue of God is that he wants us to know him more intimately, to know him better because he is life, eternal life himself. And if you're not careful, and I'm not careful, we do have an experience with him, and we know him in a certain measure, but we never go past that. And so we end up like them with seven tribes that don't have their inheritance. And they watch other people of the tribes, they've got their inheritance. But well, how come you're, why don't you have your inheritance? Oh, those guys are mean. They got iron chariots. They got soldiers. They curse. They're mean. I don't, I don't want to get in a fight with them. Yeah, but you've got a promise from God, nobody can stand before you. Yeah, but who in their right mind believes God? You're not getting it yet. You're not getting it yet. All right, you, you got something to read for me, Rev. I'll try to do it with the Bible. Uh, read Romans 6, 16. Give them a microphone. Know ye not that to whom you yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. Now watch, now watch this. Keep reading. But God be thanked that ye were the servants of sin. Wait a minute. Now, you were the servants of sin, but that word in the Greek is not servant. That word in the Greek is slaves. It said you were slaves of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered unto you. Read verse 18. Being then made free from sin, ye became the servants that of That word righteous. is servants. So you were slaves, and now you're servants and sons. You were held against your will. God supernaturally, miraculously freed you and let you go. Then he enlisted you in his kingdom and his army, and now you are the servants of God, and you are the sons of God. You now became family. But the issue in that whole thing of 16, 17, 18, it says, to whom you yield yourselves to. You can't get saved without yielding to the will of God. You can't. And we cannot possess all that God has promised us if we're not willing to yield to faith, to courage, to action. Now, 
Now, you know, at least you should know by now, that I believe you need the baptism of the Holy Ghost to be in the body of Christ. I believe that. I believe that Jesus Christ went to Calvary for one reason. Well, he's not only to pay for our sins, but you've got to understand something. When God takes you and I to Calvary, he wants us to see the love of God in action. He wants us to believe that that blood that was shed for us can set us free. Okay? But see, contrary to what the world says, Calvary is all there is involved with it, but it's not. You got to have Calvary, you got to have the burial, you got to have the resurrection, you got to have the ascension, you got to have the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. So, so God gives us a visit at Calvary so we can experience the love of God. Then he gives us an experience at Pentecost so we can experience the nature and life of God. Because if you and I don't have the Holy Ghost, we do not possess the life of God. Because the Holy Ghost is the divine nature of God that comes to live in us. Yeah, uh, have you had a hard day? No? You just you kind of act like Christmas or something, you know, Thanksgiving. Okay, just stay with me. Uh, Galatians 5.24, did I give that to you? And they that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lust. See, that's our problem. See, we, we got saved because he got crucified. And then we come out of darkness into light, out of error into truth, out of death into the life of God. And then, if not careful, we're blown away when God says, okay, time to crucify your flesh. Oh, no, I'm a one-dimensional Christian. I just believe in Calvary's crucifixion. There's always two crosses, the one he died on and the one I continually die on. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the lust thereof. May I say this kindly as I can? When you and I first repented and were water baptized in Jesus' name and filled with the Holy Ghost, we did not crucify all that flesh that was alive in us. We just repented of mistakes and errors and transgressions, and God in his mercy and kindness forgave us. Now, let's see if I can get an amen on this. And when we were born again, we made a commitment. We are going to keep this flesh under subjection. We are going to stand against everything and anything that's anti-God. And knowingly or unknowingly, we become tired of soldiers' fatigues. We're tired of always conflict, always contests, always another hill to climb, always another valley to go through, always another stinking Canaanite to knock his brains out, always another giant showing up in the valley, always another lust that I got to deal with, always another feeling I got to crucify. And after a while, Instead of continually crucifying the flesh, we coexist. And the Lord is looking at us, me, thee, and saying, how come you're not possessing everything I provided for you? Well, we've learned, uh, you know, pray 15, 20 minutes, throw some money in the till, stay here, nobody bothers us. I mean, what's the difference? Yeah, but I, I, I gave you this big map. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And these signs shall follow them that believe. That's part of your possession. Why aren't you possessing what I promised? Real easy. Unless we earnestly contend for the faith, which was once delivered to the saints, we'll never possess what's been promised. What's scary is, if we don't hurry up and start yearning to possess what's been promised, God will raise up another generation and leave us. Now, you don't think he's able to do that, but I tell you, he is. He brought all them folks out of Egypt's bondage, and those folks died by the millions in the wilderness, and he raised up a generation that wasn't circumcised, that had never seen the miracles and signs and wonders of God, and they took the promised land. I don't want some Johnny come lately coming in here and taking my word. I don't. 
<clears throat> is it, you read Galatians 5.24, right? Okay. You, uh, 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 Ephesians 6.10, did I give that to you? No, you don't worry about it. It's okay. I, uh, I, I, Bible said in Colossians 3, 1 through 7, and they that are Christ, have, Galatians crucified the flesh, but in, in Colossians 3, 1 through 7, he said, mortify therefore the deeds of the body. Make dead those things. Why? Because they're going to fight you, and they're going to fuss with you, and they're going to keep you out of the promises of God. And, and I, I, I'm, I'm not a liar when I'm standing up here. I get weary fighting. I get tired of vigils. I get tired of, of, of consistent, constant fasting and, and hours and hours of study and hours of praying. I get, I get tired of all that. I just kind of wish to say, would you just do your thing and I'll sit here on my rear end and wait. And, and, and God seems to say, no, if you don't go after it, I'll just let him have it. I gave it to you. The land is yours. But you have to dispossess what's standing against you. And seven of them tribes said, not us. We're just happy to be free from Pharaoh. We don't give a flip about the promised land. We don't give a flip about any of the things that you've given us. Do you realize in all the history of Israel, as far as I can find out, only one time in the history of Israel did Israel ever possess everything in the promised land, and that was a brief few days when Solomon had reigned. And he went nuts and lost it all. And yet all these things, God, is, I, I don't know about you, but me, I, I'm tired of people being sick. I'm, I'm, I'm tired of people being addicted. I'm tired of people having no victory. I'm tired of telling people just believe in Jesus. Just believe in Jesus. Man, we need a demonstration of old time power. We need God to sweep in the house and drive out of people stuff that's tormenting them. I'm, I'm not trying to rouse you up and just trying to hey, hey, hey. I'm just trying to challenge you. I'm challenging myself. Eric, I, I do possess some of the stuff he promised me. But I'm not possessing all that he purchased from me. In other words, what the stuff that he promised me, he already purchased from me. And he's put all things under his feet. And you're the body of Christ. That means it's under you. But sometimes it's not as easy to walk in that liberty, to walk in that dimension. Why? Because every time you take a step, foes show up. Canaanites show up. Iron chariots show up. Giants show up. And so you're either going to go fight against them and possess your possessions, or you're going to be satisfied to just possess the little bit of liberty and freedom you have. And I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm just saying you're not an asset at all. Can you imagine two and a half million Jews who went into the promised land and went 183 feet into the promised land and that's where they stayed and they never went anyplace else? And they would just tell each other at their church service, you know, all this land's ours. And Canaanites would ride by in a chair and said, you really believe that? <laughs> and they all just stayed around Shiloh because that's where the tabernacle was and that's where the presence of God was. And they told each other how they owned all this land. This is all ours. God gave it to us. Well, if God gave it to you, how come you got all them stupid idiots living over there? Oh, well, he gave us a mandate. Kick them out. He said, as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. And no man shall be able to stand before you if you walk in my ways and walk in my truth and obey me and submit yourself to me. I will enable you and strengthen you to go into areas that you're afraid of. I, I, I thought I was doing really good. Didn't 2 Corinthians 7 and 1 said, Let us cleanse ourselves of all the filthiness of flesh and spirit, 
perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So I don't think it's the mandate and the, uh, the uh, requirement of the pulpit in this church to always tell you how to dress and how to live and how to look. I probably have some things I need to suggest and tell you what I think is right. But you know what? I can tell you everything. Jesus Christ could stand right here and tell you what to do and what not to do. And when he finished, you'd leave and either you apply it or you don't apply it. Because he is not... <laughs> He is not going to coerce anybody and make us do it. It says, cleanse yourself from all the filthiness of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So, so the perfection of holiness, of Christ-likeness, is the responsibility of everybody. Preacher, saint. Now, the Pope didn't give direction and give some commandments and mandates, but when it's all said and done... You either challenge the Philistines, you either challenge the Hittites, you either challenge the Canaanites, or you just wave at them as you go to your mailbox. Hey, Bill, how are you? And you just coexist. You don't bother them. Those dirty, filthy, God-hating spirits, they don't bother you. You ever notice that in the political realm? As long as you don't challenge those dirt bags, they don't bother you. You don't bother them. But you make some decisions to go into some of their land and their little safeguards and their stuff, and now you've got a political war on your hands. As long as you stay on that side of the line and I stay on this side of the line, we're just, we live with each other, no problem. I know you're a liar and a cheater and a whoremonger and a child raper. It doesn't matter. You stay over there and I stay over here. But I'll lie to myself and say, you know, all this is mine. I just ain't got the guts or the courage to get you out of it. By the way, these other tribes that got into their inheritance, guess how they got in? They fought their way in. They attacked what was against them. They defeated the foes. Why? Because we had the same scripture like they had. Not by might and not by power, but by my spirit, saith the Lord. Now, we love to quote that scripture that the Lord's going to do it. But when he battles, he battles through us and in us. If I'm going to get the victory over an area in my life, temper, lust, anger, frustration, whatever, church service ain't going to do it. I might get inspired and uplift and challenged to try, but I'm going to have to turn around and grab that stuff by the neck, and I'm going to say, you are not going to dictate to me. You are not going to dominate me. Don't you get it? Those... Those unconquered tribes of Canaan are equal to the unconquered areas of my life and your life. Now, the people in Israel were saved. They were redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. The Spirit of God brought them out. But they're tolerating all kinds of stuff. And in, in all that toleration, there's always somebody either like Joshua, and I don't put myself in the same class, I'm just using it as a comparative example, or a schmo like me that says, hey, when are you going to go after the stuff that's yours? Joshua's almost 90 years old. And he's complaining to him. He says, man, we've been in the promised land a long time. All this land, he takes the map out again. All this stuff with the Hittites and the Amorites. Well, why haven't you possessed the promise? Well, you know, really, Joshua, that, that involves self-denial and commitment and dedication and sacrifice and, and confrontation and conflict. And, and um, <laughs> See, there's always somebody in the camp that is thankful what we have, but unhappy what we don't have. And here's Joshua. I'm paraphrasing. Hey, you dummies. How come all that land ain't possessed yet? I wonder if some of them idiots are saying, well, we've been waiting on you to take it. You jerk! I've been fighting for you schmoes since we started. 
Well, you talk about somebody that could cop an attitude. Now, see, Joshua is a much greater and better man than me, but I just got this temptation. When I, if I had dealt with some of these lame brain fools that he had to deal with, about why didn't you take some more of this land and fight this for me, I would have been Joshua. I would have said, hey, look at here, fool. You see the bottom of my sandals? I wore them dudes out thanks to a 40-year march over your stupidity. Me and Caleb have been watching 40 years in the wilderness because you wouldn't take the land that God gave to you in the first place. Now, don't come to me with that baloney story again and say, why don't I get you the victory? You stole 40 years out of my life, you jerks. I'm, I feel like talking now. You, have you ever wondered why when they marched around those 13 times around the walls of Jericho that Joshua, you read it, and Joshua was explicit, and he was almost in a rage when he turned around and told everybody in Israel, very politely, Shut your mouths! Do not let a word come out of your stupid mouths! I'm not taking another 40 year march. I just finished 40 years over your stupid mouths. Because 40 years ago when the Lord gave you the land, you called God a liar and said, we can't take the land. And when you brought that unbelieving, ungodly report back, God said, I heard what you said. These ten times I've tried to help you and show you miracles, and now you're calling me a liar, and I can't do what I promised you? Okay, fine. Take off towards the wilderness. I'll give you a year for every day you spend in the promised land. Forty days, forty years, no problem. And when they got ready to go around Jericho, I can see Joshua saying, shut your mouth. Pass out the duct tape. I don't even, if you go to whisper, I'm going to cut your head off. I don't want another 40 day trip with snakes and scorpions and stuff. I've been through that already. Shut your mouth. You know what a trial of faith it was for people who like to run their mouths? I just wonder how many of walking around that was, uh, and the other guy said, shh. <laughs> wonder how many when they're walking around, some imbeciles about ready to say, I don't get what this stupid stuff is. Walk shh, 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 shh. <laughs> now, laugh all you want to, but I'm going to tell you something. How powerful the tongue is. People can use their tongue in the wrong way and sentence everybody else to trouble. I like that. That's pretty good. I know I'm, I'm not making everybody happy. I can tell by the feeling here that, that, that this church doesn't want to be challenged with anything. I don't know about you. I, I think there's possessions that have been promised and provided for us that we're not embracing and not taking. If you read Obadiah, just for your homework, read Obadiah chapter 1 verse 17. It says, and in that day shall Israel possess his possessions. So there was a day coming in the future when Israel is going to possess his possessions. Only possessed it one time for a few days in the days of Solomon. They never possessed it ever. Why? Because people don't want to fight. You know one of the things that's keeping us back from possessing all the gifts and possessions of God? Not trying to be unkind. You don't go to the prayer room. Now Wednesday, I cut you a slack. You're working all day. You've come in. That's a sacrifice. I am but Sunday morning and Sunday night, this whole church ought to be in the prayer room. If we're not in the prayer room, we ought to be praying here instead of like a cackling bunch of hens talking. Why? Because we want to possess what God has promised us. And if we're not possessing it, 
We need to ask God to create a desire in us to possess it. God has given us exceeding and precious promises whereby we might be partakers of the divine nature. That's what Peter's epistle says. So we've got promises. I don't know about you, man. You know, it doesn't bother you. I don't know why. It doesn't bother you. These signs shall follow them that believe. That doesn't happen. Why doesn't it bother you? Why? Why, why does it not just drive you crazy? That we're not laying hands on the sick and the sick are recovering. We believe in the promise of the baptism of the Holy Ghost, talking in tongues. We believe in Jesus' name, baptism. We believe in repentance. We believe in confession and all. But what about all the supernatural things that were promised us? You don't really believe it was just for the first century church. When you read Acts 4, 29 through 31, Peter's wonderful prayer. Now, you understand, he's just been used to preach the Pentecost sermon, Acts 2.38. He's also been used by God to pull that lame guy up out of the ground there in, in, in Acts uh, 3, in front of the gate, beautiful. Okay, so what I have, I give you. Bow, get up. Boom. But now they're under pressure. They've been arrested. They've been assaulted by the idiots, the religious jerks. And so they turn around and threaten them, we'll beat you within an inch of your life. And instead of Peter saying, now, Lord, could you give us a place where we won't have any conflict? Could you just like, could we have nice church without disruptive church? And, and he turns around in Acts 4, 29. Now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants. Here it is boldness that we may preach thy word now here's what here's how he wants the boldness to come by stretching forth thine hand that signs of, whoo, and wonders and miracles would be done by the name of thy holy child Jesus and when he finished praying the whole place was shaken and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and spake the word with boldness and signs and wonders and miracles took place. Oh, yeah, Ananias and Sapphira showed up in the next chapter, but God killed them and took care of that real fast. And then Stephen was greatly used in signs, wonders, and miracles in Acts 6. Go to Acts 6, Acts 7. And they attacked him and assaulted him. They stoned him to death. Fine. Then in Acts 8, here we come now. Philip's going down to Samaria, and he's having signs, wonders, and miracles, and cripples are walking, and lame folks are walking, and, and great things are happening. And then God takes him out and takes him all the way to the Ethiopian desert over here to meet that eunuch, to baptize him in Jesus' name. And then in the middle of the desert, he says, I need you over in Azotus. Hold still. Put your hands in your pocket. Keep your hands in. Here we go. And you go. And in a few minutes, he ends up in a Zodas preaching. Say, oh, well, that just happened then. That's our problem. Our faith is locked to them. Our expectation is locked to them. We need to start believing that God wants us to possess what has been promised to us. And the only way that I know that can happen is God to baptize you and I with a large baptism of discontent. Because discontent can deliver us from business as usual, from mediocrity, from mundane, you're not living. I know I've, I've been at war for a long time here, and I, and I know there's Sherry and there's Tuselli and the crew, you know, and, uh, and I thank God for your burden and your desire to help these sweet people, but, and, and, and I, I hope I'm not offensive, but th that's not the God way. That's our way because we don't possess the God way. If you can find me any time where Jesus walked into a village and they brought him deaf people, and he said, oh, here's how you deal with the deaf. No, he went and turned around and he said, here's how you deal with the deaf. Now, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you to command this body. Here, now, open, open. Now, 
I've seen that in my life. I've seen that happen in crusades and conferences that I've been in. Ears popped open. People that couldn't tongue talk, they just started talking. I've seen that happen. But I haven't seen it enough. And I keep asking the Lord, I said, Lord, how come it happens when I go here and I go there and it doesn't happen when I'm here? And it's like the Lord's saying, they don't want it. Oh, they want it in their thoughts and dreams, but they won't pursue it. And I require a people who are my people to pursue what I promised them, to go after what I promised them, to become dissatisfied with the level that they are living at. I thought I had a good Bible study here. Really did. I thought I had a good Bible study. Those, those, those seven areas in that promised land that was never possessed by Israel, the inhabitants resisted them. They fought against them. And they are similar to us from the book of Ephesians. It's the same exact thing. While they resisted them in the physical we have things that resist us from possessing our possessions in the spiritual. Consider unholy habits. Practice sin. Secret sin. Wrong motives. Wrong desires. Bitterness. Anger. Unforgiveness. I'll find you here sooner or later. Mm, mm. I'm sorry. Selfish living. The kingdom of self rules. Don't want to hurt you. Just talking. Can I talk to you, Eric? You're my friend. You ready? The terrible indifference that's possessed by so many here towards spiritual things. You're not against them. No, you're really not against them. You're just not for them. Spiritual things. I've been praying day in, day out, and I thank you. I want to comment, commend you and compliment you on the beginning of this new year. Ever since we had communion and we crossed over the river, you people have been so wonderful, and you've been sanctifying yourself and dedicating yourself and committing, and I thank God for the, the, the start that we made in 2017, but now we're at a crossroads here. Now we got to turn around. It's time to kill self. It's, it's time to deny self. It's time to say, okay, you, you got to go. You, you, I, I, I got to bring you in subjection. I, I, I want to touch that power. I want to embrace that truth. I want, I want, it's not that we don't have to pay our bills and fight things and do things, but but I've been praying every day, and I, I hope and pray that God's not frustrated with my language or my speech or something. But I keep asking God when I'm praying every day, God, thank you for what you're doing in our church, but we just need a giant whoosh. We just need a, a wind of the Holy Ghost. We just need a, a downpour. We need a deluge. We need somehow the heavens to open up. I feel like Isaiah in Isaiah 64. Oh, that thou would come down and rend the heavens as thou did before and do things for us that we were not expecting. I don't know about you, but I want divine interruptions. I want divine interventions. I want services where we can't finish the preaching and we can't finish the singing and we can't finish the program. The Holy Ghost just gets a hold of people. I don't mean to be offensive, but sometimes you ought to, you ought to look at the folks you're sitting next to and every once in a while within two or three services, if, they, if those poor people don't ever give you one of these once in a while, you need to move. I wish to God, I wish to God I could raise up Brother Bird and get him back here just for a few minutes, man. With, he had that beautiful white hair and he got to jumping down here and he danced down the aisles and just, you'd go to talk to him sometimes and he'd say, oh, brother, uh, brother Arnold. 
And you'd have to just kind of put money in the meter, wait till he finished, and then he'd finally come back and say, are you back on the planet now? Nobody remembers him when he used to sing up here, something better than gold. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I got something. And he'd get to dancing and jumping and carrying on. And I'm going to ask you something. You're, you're laughing and smiling like I'm some imbecilic fool. Where are the shakers in this church? Where are the Quakers in this church? Where are the people that say glory? Where are the people that break out in tears and sobbing and falling down? Well, what happened to us that we have people once in a while that get to juking and jamming and dancing around and get it running here a little bit? And, and, and then we scare them down. emotional liar you're selective with your emotion I've been asking God day in and day out Lord I need to get pregnant with the power show me what to do I need you to equip me I need you to infuse me I need you to do something I'm not trying to get my name out there I'm not trying to get my picture taken I just want to represent you like you told me you said we could have power in the Holy Ghost. You said we could do things in the Holy Ghost. Maybe we need to start praying what Jesus said. The Son can of Himself do nothing. Watch. What He sees the Father do, He does. What He hears the Father say, He speaks. What is He saying? The flesh, the incarnated flesh, was in union with the Spirit. And the flesh couldn't do anything. But when the Spirit spoke, and the Spirit, we need to ask God, show me, talk to me. Either we are a supernatural people, or we're full of hot air. I'm not talking about us going crazy and having a carnival, but my God, all the joy and the victory and the grace of God ain't in the sitting and it ain't in the staring and it ain't in the being silent and it ain't in always behaving. Sometimes you gotta just bust a move. In the day that you seek me with your whole heart, saith the Lord, you shall surely find me. Would you mind just, you folks that are standing, don't sit. You folks that are standing, don't sit. Just turn around and, and yell at about 20 or 30 people that are sitting. Say, uh, I want my stuff. I want my possessions. I want what has been promised to me. I want to represent God like he deserves to be represented. We're not supposed to be a normal church. We're supposed to be an abnormal church. We're supposed to be spiritual, dynamic, unexplainable. I, I'm, 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 I'm almost done. You, you be seated just, just for a second. Can, can, can you hear me? Robert, is that you out there? They just turned the lights out. What in the world's going on here? Anyway, uh, do you understand the vast difference between God's ideal and Israel's ideal? Wait a minute. Between God's ideal and our ideal. Here's what, let me tell you, this ought to inspire you. Here's what God's ideal is. Romans 8, 28, 29. That ye might be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. That's his ideal. And the works that I've done, you can do. And you should do. 
And if you don't do it, I'm going to ask you why you didn't do it. Because I gave you power to do it. And I gave you my word to do it. And so what are you afraid of? Oh, you're like those silly Israelis. You're afraid of the Canaanites. You're afraid of the news media. You're afraid of the whoremongers and the crazy people and the nuts and the jerks and the fools. What do you give a flip about their stupid opinion? They can't even keep themselves out of hell. What are you worried about them for? I'm, I'm fighting you now. I'm fighting you. 35 years ago, I came here and I committed myself with prayer and fasting that we were going to turn into a spiritual church, a supernatural church. 35 years later, I know I have totally failed, and I'm sorry that I have. I've tried everything I could, but I could not make you do what you don't want to do. You didn't mind me being spiritual, but you like being carnal. You like being worldly. I can't do anything about that. I've given it the best I can. And when you read Joshua's last dissertation to his people in 22, 3, and 4 of, of Joshua, when he turns around, he says, now look. And he starts talking to him. He says, oh, we'll serve the Lord. He turns around and says, you can't serve the Lord. He picked up in their connotation that they were not sincere. They were doing Pentecostal mouth. He said, the Lord won't tolerate your foolishness. And they swore up and down, oh, we'll serve the Lord. Isn't it funny? Two or three verses later, they served the Lord until Joshua died. Then they told them, oh, go to Hades. We're going back to whoremongers and liars and idolaters. And from the book of Joshua, you have the most desecrating book in the entire Bible, the book of Judges. And Judges is the great shame towards the kingdom of God. For everyone did that which was right in their own eyes. Why? Because there was no king in Israel. God, I, I cannot give myself after 40 some odd years of ministry to walk away and say, Oh well, I guess they enjoy being carnal and ungodly. I guess I'll just marry myself into it. I will not. You just put me in the nursing home, and I'll still talk in tongues, and I'll still read my Bible, and I'll still shout by myself. That ain't going to happen. And while I'm not in too good a shape right now where I can run around, I used to run around sometimes. I'll try to do better this week and shout a little bit through my pain train. But, it, but I'm going to at least go... If some of you folks tonight just went like this, man, we're having a revival. Let me ask you a question, and I'll try to close. If Jesus Christ was here right now, manifesting the flesh, and he was preaching and teaching this Bible study, and he did like me for 45 or 50 minutes and preached and taught the Bible study. And then he closed it and went home. Would you be thrilled with it or would you be disappointed? Because anytime I ever seen Jesus preach or teach, either prior to or after it, he says, okay, now let's have a demonstration. People did not come to Jesus to hear a Bible study or to hear a sermon. They came for deliverance. They came for direction. They came for liberty. They came to touch and taste a world that they didn't know much about, but they knew it existed. I wasn't going to say this, but I'm going to say it now. And I'm saying it, and I'm having a disclaimer. But sit down before I said it. We were at Because of the Times. Does anybody know Brother Hanscom? Brother Hanscom is our national leader of multicultural ministries. What a precious, wonderful man. He works up at headquarters at the Hazelwood Heavenlies, right up there. Okay? And I'm sitting on the, every day and every night, I'm sitting with Brother and Sister Hanscom. Sweet, sweet people. And we're trading notes, and we're talking things, and we're praying for each other and we're laying hands on each other. I mean, if, if fingerprints and palm prints get you saved, I'm saved. 
I've, I've had everything happen to me in that place but fondled. I've had people touching my legs, touching my knees, touching my head. Just, to, just they, man, they want to lay hands. They give you a massage, man. They're just laying hands every which way. And while we're sitting there, Brother Hanscom just, I'm talking to him faith. JC, I'm just on faith. God wants to heal right now. He wants, if we give him a moment, he'll, he'll stretch his hand out. He'll blow everybody's mind. And, and Brother Hanscom leans over to me. He says, Brother Arnold, my wife is in severe pain. She has been in such terrible pain. She hasn't slept since she's been here. Her back, she hurt her back. I don't know whether she fell or what happened, but she's sitting there whimpering. And he says, would you pray for her? I said, put your hand on her back. And I put her hand on her back, and I put my hand on his hand. I was trying to be polite, and I cursed that thing and bound that thing, whether it was arthritis or whether it's a herniated disc or pressured muscles or nerve pressed or whatever it is, Jesus' name, you got to go and health and strength you got to come in this body and she said thank you and i didn't feel anything and i didn't talk in tongues i just was boom in the morning we had the morning service and he's got tears coming down his face and he says brother arnold my wife slept all last night and has no back pain You have not because you ask not. He that comes to God must believe that God is and God is a rewarder. You, 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 can, you can stand with me. I, 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 now, please don't misconstrue that because it, you, like, like I did something. I didn't do nothing. I, I just prayed and I believed God. That night he come in and he's hugging my neck and he's going, Oh, my dear brother, my dear brother, look at the smile on my wife's face. That's the next day. She looks over. She goes, no pain, no pain. I said, good, good. Why did that happen one time and I prayed for somebody else and it don't happen the other time? I don't know. But I'm not intimidated by no answer. I'm not intimidated by some stinking Canaanite that is sticking his tongue out of me and laughing and saying, bet you can't get me moved. <laughs> Casting down imaginations, pulling down strongholds. <laughs> See, sometimes our business life gets in the way. Sometimes our hobbies our jobs, our joys, our entertainment, our weak areas in our life, all these things are like the Canaanites that won't get out of our way. And we have to fight against them. And we have to make them stop. And I don't know about you. I'm not as powerful as, as you people are, apparently. But I pray against things, and I curse things, and I bind things, and sometimes it's almost like they look and go... And I said, I bind you in Jesus' name, and I command you to stop it. And just... I said, I don't care what you're doing. You're going. You're going. You've got to go. I plead the blood of Jesus over you. I bind you in Jesus' name. And they'll eventually go. But sometimes they don't go on the first try. Because blab it and grab it, name it and claim it don't work for me. I got things to fight. And Israel didn't get their promises. They got the land, but they wouldn't go and make any excursions because enemies were there. Foes were there. Iron chariots were there. Trained soldiers were there. You ready for this? Have you ever thought how unbelievable this was in God's mindset? That he asked an infant, an infant nation and economy to overcome and entrenched, well cultured people. They were infant nation. They've been walking around for 40 years. They just got a few rules. And he wants them to displace the people who know art, who know culture, who know science, who graded music, who are social people. And he wants the infant people to knock them out. Don't you get it? When the Lord sent that church out from Pentecost, it was an infant body. It was a brand new creation of God, the body of Christ. And he sent them to challenge Rome and Greek. 
The Corinthian church, the cities, all these places, had no class, had no clout, didn't have people in the White House, didn't have people in the mayor's run, couldn't pull any strings. I got a kick out of what I was told while I was at because of the times, and I'm trying to close. We were talking about, we had one of the sessions about counseling people and people that have trouble. You counsel these people. And, and Brother Anthony was so funny. He said, my dad, if you remember Brother G.A. Mangan, he was always like this. Let me tell you just right, right, right here. He said when he'd have somebody, he never counseled hardly anybody in 30 or 40 years of pastoring. He said when he'd get people that want to counsel him, he said, now how much fasting and prayer have you put into this? And when they said they hadn't fasted and prayed and been to prayer, he said, get out of here. Don't waste my time. And he just ushered him out of his office. He said, if you won't talk to the king of glory for some help, who do you think I am? Good move. Okay, I'm making you mad. I'm sorry, Lord. I'm sorry they're all mad. I don't know why they're mad. I don't have no idea why they love living with the Canaanites. They just love the Canaanites. I, I pray that you'd help us that we could have a breakthrough. Give us grace and strength and help us to challenge the things that are standing up in our face and saying they won't go down. They will go down, Lord. If we'll fast and pray and believe you, they will go down and we can possess our possessions. Forgive us for, for just not pursuing the things that you have promised us. Help us. Put a, put a divine discontent in all of our hearts for the status quo and create in our hearts and our spirits a yearning for the supernatural of God. I'm not asking for wildfire and crazy loony stuff. I'm just asking you, Lord, that, that you would give us mighty demonstrations of the Holy Ghost. Please forgive us for sins and failures and for being mediocre about stuff. Lord, help us in Jesus' name. And everybody said amen. God bless you. Shake hands. Be friendly. Don't forget the big thing on Saturday. What time is it? 9? 10? 10. 10 o'clock, the training session with Brother Davies and Rashid Collins. And we'll feed you for free, and we'll give you the tapes. Shake hands. Be friendly. Go with God. Hey, Jim. In Jude... We find him writing in verse 3, I wanted to write of our common salvation. But he said, I realized it was necessary for me to write to you of the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It's very specific in Greek. It was delivered once for all. We do not have an evolving gospel that needs to be updated with the latest theories of psychology and sociology and legality. But we have the faith which once for all was delivered to the saints. It saved people in the first century. It saves people in the 21st century.